Okay, so let's get started. Uh, hello and welcome to my uh, talk about wine. What, I, what I'm going to talk about, um, my name is Stefan Dösinger. I'm, I'm from Koji first, but today I'm officially here on behalf of the Wine Project. Um, what I'm going to talk about today are some updates, what, what changed in wine in terms of traffic over the last year. Uh, and I'm also I want also want to, to take the opportunity to address this gathering about our opinion of the Direct 3D9 stage tracker that has gone into Nisa in a few months ago. Uh, just first a quick question: Is my voice understandable? It's loud enough. <coughs> okay, so let's go, go ahead. So yeah, the the outline progress report. And I uh, made it clear here already, we think the Direct 3D9 stage tracker in NISA is um, a bad idea and I want to underline uh, why we think that with uh, numbers. And then later on go present some ideas how we can improve the, where we, where we have to improve, how we can improve the OpenCL interface between Vine and NISA. But first for the wine update, the big changes that happened in the, in the past months were that we finally are able to handle focus loss of full screen Direct 3D applications, <coughs> which means that when you're running a game, you press, uh, most of the time it's Alt Tab, uh, then the Windows game will minimize, wine will restore your screen resolution, you can use a desktop, and when you are done checking your email, you can click on the game again and it opens up. And depending on how well the game is written, the game realizes the focus loss and pause the game in the meantime or whatever it's planning to do. Um, yeah, this uh, this works on on OS X. It also works on uh, on KDE uh, FVWM, and I forgot to add it to the slides. It also works on XFCE. Unfortunately, the window minimization does not yet properly work on Metacity and any uh, on, on Compass and any any window managers that are forced from Metacity, which means uh, Marco from um, Mate Desktop, Matta from GNOME Shell, and I forgot the name of the window manager that uh, the Artinox port of GNOME Shell is using. Uh, the main problem here is that on Windows, games usually create a window without a minimize button, so we do not set uh, the minimize function hint, which is intentional because uh, we don't want a minimize button on the window when the game does not uh, want one, but the game still wants to minimize itself through Win32 commands. We call xiconify window when that happens, and the window manager refuses to minimize our window and puts it into a broken state, which for most purposes means that the game is now crashed, everything on your X server is inaccessible because there's a frozen window, and you get to restart your X server. I send bug reports to the window managers and uh, I am I'm discussing the proper fix for that. What is somewhat related to focus handling and resolution restore is that we need a solution to restore the disk space when the game crashes. Either, either because it just really crashes or because it just calls exit and does not cleanly restore, cleanly tear down the Direct 3D setup. I will get to a suggestion about that later. We now started uh, properly working on Direct 3D 10. Um, the progress of that is slow, but it thinks uh, but we, we are making progress. Uh, and we recently finished uh, the RE3D 10 texture sampling support. The main big thing that is still missing are resource handling. For example, we cannot <coughs> sample from buffers. We cannot render to buffers. And we do not support the format reinterpretation that Direct3D 10 added. Uh, the reason why our roof is on fire now because of D3D10 is that Microsoft Office uses it. It does not use it directly. It uses a different library called Direct3D, which Microsoft implemented on top of uh, Direct3D10, 
and we have to do the same because the DirectTV interface exposes its DirectTV 10 uh, foundation. So our roof is on fire now. <laughs> so this should, this is this is pretty important right now, and it should be, it should be finished within. Uh, I, I hope within the year. As part of our DirectTV 10 work, we are now working on switching to OpenGL 4 context rather than running everything with legacy context plus extension on that. Um, we mostly need it on macOS, which does not expose some newer functionality on legacy context. And I hope that this is making some things easier for the driver. And I'm told that Nusa has some, some expensive fallbacks when you use core context. macOS does so as well. So I hope that this, in this, this removes some performance obstacles that are currently in our way. Uh, Matteo is sending patches for that. I think we may be done with that in a month or two. And the main, the main problem we are still facing are direct draw style blitz, which are in a common code type with everything. And we have to replace them with uh, proper vertex buffer based draws that draw a texture triangle, upload things with pixel buffer objects and so on. And direct draw color keying emulation currently uses the alpha test, which the manual is also removed from core context. Like it was about two years, one and a half years ago when I published a preview of my command screen patches. What they essentially do is that they move the direct, uh, the, the, uh, the 3D call to a different thread, which is something Windows does that improves game performance by using one more CPU core. It also improves game performance because it allows us to uh, do the thread synchronization if the game forces the multiple threads ourselves by just doing synchronous writes to our uh, log tree ring buffer rather than call GL flush and GL finish on everything. The status of that is that uh, ever since I published that, this work is blocked on the DirectTV 10 resource changes because it's a lot easier to switch to DirectTV 10 style resource management when we do not have to take care of thread synchronization at the same time. So ETA on that is unknown. It's once DCV10 is there, we will move ahead with this. In terms of performance tracking over the years, uh, I am running pretty much nightly tests with various games and benchmarks. Um, since I'm using the Pharonix test suite for that, you have to read the results in a different direction because it starts with the new ones and then tracks back to the old ones. So these two things here are regressions. One of them I was able to isolate. The other one, I tried to downgrade Nisa and Ryan and it got even worse performance than I had post uh, after the regression. So I don't know what the, what the other tick down is. Why do I show this ages old 3D Mark 2000 result? Well, it's because that one has two changes rather than every other benchmark that just shows this one benchmark, uh, this one regression. So this graph is just more interesting to look at. Um, yeah, the, this Ryan patch, of course, this regression is a bit of a tricky thing. We use this to make uh, games that use Direct2D and OpenGL at the same time work. So games initialize OpenGL and a query the video memory size of Direct2D. That initializes another OpenGL context, changes the pixel format of the window, and boom, the original OpenGL setup is broken. Uh, the author of that patch was looking to uh, better solution that involves creating a child window for direct for, for both OpenGL and Direct2D and then just switching between a child window on a present call. But he got into an argument with Alexandra halfway through the process. So now we are stuck with a working but slow solution. And I don't know when, when we are going, when we are will, be, will be able to, to move on with that. But as you can see, except for this thing, performance is mostly static and it has been static for, for the past uh, two years, which may is a bad thing because performance is still bad. It's also a good thing because 
Vine has seen increased development support for new things, Misa has support for new things, and most of them happen without performance regressions. Um, I'm also testing this performance on the Radeon 300 Gallium driver. Uh, it looks pretty much the same. One quick word about our development environment, since there are often uh, conspiracy theories that we only care about macOS, or we only care about NVIDIA, or we only care about this or that. Well, well, well it's back again. <laughs> so Andri is doing his development on RC Conduit G, which is currently the only driver that actually passes our test tube. I am, since I'm using this Mac laptop here, using the NVIDIA binary driver. And due to our work at Code Reapers, we, we, keep an, we are forced to keep an eye on macOS, since when that stops working, uh, our, our financials notice that, so we have to keep a track on that. Anything prior to DirectX 10 part is pretty much bit rotting. We do get bug reports for it when something breaks, and we try to fix it as soon as we can, but no no developer is using any DirectX 9 or earlier card anymore. We try to keep it working since a especially troubling thing is that Internet Explorer uses Direct Draw. So when we break the old cards, then Internet Explorer breaks. And this is used in a lot of offices as old cards. So we get reports when, this get when something goes wrong, but no real development happens on that. And for Intel GPUs, I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, we have pretty few bug reports about that. Um, no developer is using it, which either the few bug reports either mean that everything is working just fine or that nothing is working and everybody gave up. Uh, so is, is anyone here using Vine, Vine on an Intel GPU? Knowingly, does, do you have any problems with it? <laughs> yes? <laughs> Sorry? Too old yeah, too old hardware, yeah. But so. If something is terribly broken, please tell me, because uh, I have an Intel GPU in that device, but I'm only testing something when there is a bug report and something is broken. And I cannot, I do not, like you will see this later, I do not have performance comparison for the Intel driver compared to Windows, because I cannot access the Intel GPU on Windows due to the BIOS emulation stuff uh, Apple added on this laptop and booting Windows via eFi on this laptop is pretty much impossible. And even and even the people who manage to do that cannot access the Intel GPU because the driver refuses to load. So sorry, no no idea about Intel GPUs. So let's get to the main part. I'm pretty sure sh yeah, this may be maybe a bit of a controversial topic. Uh, the Direct 9 state tracker. Um, I like that it's been written, so thank you to Axel Davy and all the others who have worked on it because it's, uh, I think it's a pretty useful tool for debugging performance problems and better understanding them. But we do not see it as a long-term solution and the main reason for that is that it is a gigantic code duplication for just essentially one corner case. And let me explain what I mean with this one corner case. So we have multiple generations of GPUs, we have multiple vendors of GPUs, we have currently usable three client APIs from Direct Draw to Direct 3D9, which we support with one code base. And the main main use the main operating system targets are Linux and OS 10. But Windy 3D, as strange as it may sound, also has uh, is used on Windows as well, mostly by old games. So when when good old games ship an, o an ancient direct draw game that does not work anymore, sometimes they uh, add in uh, Vine's direct draw library and, vi and Vine D3D to make it work on, uh, on newer Windows systems. So we, we have a use case for all this on Windows, even though it's rather limited for a pretty unitary thesis. And everything here is supported with one code base in Vine. And uh, the, the Guardian 9 state tracker in practice is only usable on the Radeon, on, on the DirectX 10 and 11 class Radeon GPUs. 
it is in theory usable on NVIDIA GPUs as well, but if people care about performance on NVIDIA GPUs, they are more likely to just use the binary driver instead of using the 239 state tracker, at least uh, that's what I think. And yeah, the our code base that supports all the operating systems and all the client libraries is about 80,000 lines of code, including the, the front end for DirectDraw, DirectDV8 and DirectDV9, executing the tests. And uh, the, the nine state tracker is about 20,000 lines of code and it just supports DirectDV9 on one of those cases and we, it will never be able to replace the, the 80,000 lines of code. We will forever have to maintain both of them. And this is, this is our main concern. It's a big, it's a big, big cloud draw when you probably need a scalper to, to fix, to fix uh, the performance problem. Also the way it is integrated in Vine is problematic. Uh, the main problem here is that Gallium is an internal interface for Mesa. You do not want external lib external software to call it directly because you want to be able to change it. And on also on the other side on Vine, the interface between our DirectDV9 front end and how we interface with X11 is an internal interface. Uh, you do not want to, to publish any, any internal stuff here because you want to be able to free to, to change this interface. And that makes integrating Mesa with Vine in that way pretty difficult. Using the DirectDV9 interface is directly as the interface between the two libraries is not possible because the DirectDV9 interface has the window handles around and hard codes some assumptions about the Windows 32 API that at very least in the way it's currently done needs a bunch of callbacks that access Vine internal data. And uh, as I'm going to show next, is that the nine state tracker does not solve the actual problem. It improves things a bit, but it doesn't really solve the problem. So to do that, I have some benchmarks just for sake of completion. This is uh, my, my test machine. It is about four years old by now. So the, the Radeon GPU, I think it's that one is already DirectX 11 capable as well as the, the GeForce GPU, so it is, a, it is the same computer with two GPUs in it, which makes the comparison between the, H, the, the Radeon and the GeForce, whatever this thing is doing, uh, which, makes the, which makes it easy to compare the numbers between the Radeon and the uh, GeForce GPU. The Windows benchmarks were done on Windows 7. Uh, the Linux benchmarks are on my Sensor installation. Uh, Important is if you try, rather than believe my benchmarks, try to reproduce them yourself and please report to me when you get a different result because benchmarking those things is tricky and it is very easy to run into, to have some setup problem that gives you bad numbers and then you draw a conclusion based on a bug in your benchmarking. So please, if you do not, do, do not believe my numbers, try them, test them yourself and when you end up with something different, please contact me. So when you test things on Linux, uh, at first the, the performance improvement due to nine looks pretty impressive. It's about, the, like in Half-Life 2, it's about double the performance. Why am I using this old game? It's about 10 years old by now, um, mainly because it's still a good uh, test case for the short engine. And the engine in that game has constantly been, been upgraded. And also it does not have any obvious bugs. Here you can say, yeah, this game is slow just because it locks the render target or this game is slow just because it does this or that. Um, but still it, it makes very, it, it uses pretty much every DirectDV9 feature out there, but uses them in a good way. Um, with my command screen uh, implementation, I still do not see Gallium 9, which makes this even more impressive but still the my, my command screen and mine beat the native Linux port. So looking into the details, especially why uh, the command screen is slower than nine is that plain wine and my command screen are still blocked by the same bottleneck, which is the code, the, the wine distribution code and the OpenGL library. 
is just that by going moving this to a different thread, I've moved like that 20% game logic into somewhere else. So I get an, a performance improvement, but the, the essential bottleneck is still the same. So there is a problem with that. Uh, when you compare this to Windows, Windows still beats all those solutions by like a factor of three. And the problem is I see it, th the problem for me so is not so much this, the problem is this. That this, this part is what needs to be fixed, that, that, that needs fixing and not so much uh, how, how Dario CD9 performs on, uh, how, how, how Dario CD9 games perform because if you, if you improve Dario CD9, you only improve Dario CD9, you will never improve native, native Windows games or other things that run through OpenGL. So yeah, this, this is where personally I, I see the problem. When will I have, um, but to show that uh, open the OpenGL interface, I like you, you from this you could conclude that OpenGL is just a terrible interface for performance since all of all of those, except for, for nine, which is slightly faster, everything talks to Mesa with OpenGL. But if you look at uh, the, the NVIDIA blob, you see that actually doing OpenGL and doing DirectCD 9 on top of OpenGL is possible at a good performance. Like the, the native Windows port is essentially, uh, by the way, all those, this setup here is P uh, TPU limited. So I deliberately ran this on a low resolution with no anti-aliasing. So this is just CPU overhead. I will talk about the graphics card performance next, but you can see it's possible to implement OpenGL with low CPU overhead. It is possible to implement DirectCD on top of uh, OpenGL with uh, reasonable CPU performance. We so then th this is essentially why I think that we do not need a, diff a second, a different interface between our two projects to, to get good performance. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. That is, this is the core of my argument. Uh, just to, to look across, to do some extra testing. It looks like a different in a GPU limited situation. And it's funny that uh, the performance of both the Radeon card and the Nvidia card are pretty much the same on on Windows, it's like a one percent difference. The same on, uh, like, in a, GP in a GPU limited case, it's also six hundred frames per second versus, I think, six hundred five frames per second. But this is I just in a happy coincidence. At first, I thought I did my benchmarking wrong, but I couldn't find any bug in there. And I think that those cards, that, that the, those cards are essentially the same generation. So it's uh, somewhat expected that they have similar performance. But on uh, the unfortunate thing is I could not test the Half-Life 2 in a GPU limited setup on Mesa because it just insisted on turning on vSync. So I was most of the time stuck at 60 frames per second. With Gallium 9, the vSync bug did not happen. So I got about one third of the Windows performance even in a GPU limited setup and sometimes it dropped below 60 frames per second and just by guessing from where in the log game in the benchmark run the performance dropped below 60 frames i think that uh, both the, the the linux native version and vine with the command stream enabled run at also plus plus or minus 100 frames so i think the the performance of that is pretty similar and here you see a difference between the game running on the game running on a Windows driver, the Nvidia Windows driver, and the game running on the N Nvidia Linux driver. Um, yeah, that's something that the Nvidia people maybe maybe know or maybe do not know where the difference is. Uh, I suspect there is an there are some I some inefficiencies when you translate DirectCD 9 shaders to GLSL and then compile them to hardware shaders. And I, I have one, one particular suggestion later that may be able to improve this but not address it entirely. Uh, I also looked at other games. Here, for example, is uh, Civilization 5. 
that's a game that I always that I, I could not get this to run in a GPU limited fashion. It's always GPU limited. I suspect because of the heavy game logic that I think written written in Python or something. And again, we see on pro proper performance is possible. Then Vida driver demonstrates that. And uh, on on Rhine, no matter I so the performance is with and without the command stream is it's just it's pretty much exactly the same. The Linux the Linux port of the game also runs at the same performance, which is again one about one third of what Windows supports. <coughs> Nine is faster, but unfortunately this result is not really usable because it's rendered visually different uh, in a different way. It may be a feature in the sense that it stops rendering some details when zoomed out. It may be a bug. Um, I did not notice on a first look the same rendering difference on Windows, but I forgot to take a, I didn't take a screenshot, so unfortunately I don't really know if the lower quality is a bug or a feature. But either way, it does not make those, unfortunately does not make those values comparable, just added it for the sake of like what uh, completion. And uh, I'm sh like, these are, these are just two games, but the results match my general observations with other games. Actually, Davey will have a talk about ga uh, Gallium 9 in an, an hour after my talk. And uh, I've seen that he has, in some games, some wildly different numbers. So this is these are some games I need to investigate. But I still believe in a general, general conclusion that the problem, the performance problem, is not the interface between our two processes. Um, one thing that has been in the press lately, especially concerning mental, uh, AMD's mental interface, is uh, draw overhead and general and, and general overhead in uh, in OpenGL and Barrel CD and everywhere. Um, and lower overhead is also what the nine developers attribute to the improved performance and. I agree with them on that part, so Gallium 9 removes a lot of overhead that we, we have when we run through Rhine UKD, GL, and then Mesa. But uh, OpenGL is actually a pretty reasonable interface for, for well that, that can be implemented with a reasonably low draw overhead, and I believe it's not necessary to reinvent the wheel to, to lower draw overhead. And also, Low draw overhead is not uh, it's, it's it's not the holy grail. So let me show you what I mean with that. Like on I have a, I've written a simple test program in DirectD9 and OpenGL that just calls six thousand tiny draws per frame. Just draws a thousand cubes, one side of the cube per draw call, and then flips. And with that on the API card, I get on DirectD about 2,300,000 draw calls per second on Windows with DirectD. Windows with OpenGL is considerably faster, uh, but uh, Mesa has a lot more overhead, so that's about uh, 2 million, slightly under 2 million draw calls. And uh, I believe the reason why OpenGL is faster, and you will also see this on the NVIDIA side, is that DirectD 9 is an interface that does a lot of babysitting. So if you insist on using the alpha, alpha blending with the destination blend factor, but your frame buffer has no alpha channel, that's just fine. Uh, you will get a re reproducible result that essentially comes down to using a fixed alpha factor. Or if you insist on turning on a depth test without a depth buffer attached, oh, no problem, DirectD will do something reasonable for you. And this, these, this babysitting, I think, helps a lot when you are learning, learning how to use the interface. You don't run into those problems where you see a black screen, but uh, those checks, those checks make, draw, make calls everywhere more expensive and slow down applications where the developer knows what you are doing. Um, you see the same relation between DirectD and OpenGL on the NVIDIA side on Windows. What is different on the NVIDIA blob is that it just beats the hell out of 
a Windows driver in terms of draw call performance. And uh, I, I do not know why, why the NVIDIA driver is in this situation so much faster than the, uh, than the Windows driver. I suspect that because uh, Windows, win Windows adds some abstraction layers for OpenGL, where Microsoft provides the OpenGL 32.gll library, and that one then calls into the installable client dr uh, driver. And uh, that, but that's just a suspicion. I cannot look inside Windows. Yes. I disable I disable the compositing on all systems. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. So. And uh, what gives you a bit of caution here in terms of attributing fast performance to low draw overhead is you compare the, the, the API results in red and the NVIDIA results in green, you see that on even on DirectV, NVIDIA beats the uh, AMD card quite a bit, but the end result in the game was the same. So this difference apparently does not matter all that much. Um, because I if if draw overhead mattered too much, then GLXQ should be a good benchmark. And as everybody knows, GLXQ is actually a pretty terrible benchmark. Well, let me correct that. GLXQ is a good benchmark for plot, plot buffer overhead, but it's not a benchmark for general OpenGL performance. But um, as I could see in my performance tracking over time, there is a correlation between draw overhead and actual game performance. So. If we go back to my Kojima 2000 performance test, uh, you see it's dropping down or after mine 1.7.13. And here, here are the results from my draw overhead benchmark. It drops down terribly at the same time for the same reason. So there is an overhead, but don't make draw, uh, uh, there, there is a correlation between the cost of draw calls and game performance, but don't make uh, draw overhead uh, your new god. It's not. It's something to keep an eye on. And Mises draw overhead is uh, pretty high, but uh, it's if the if the draw if if the draw call benchmark gets slightly worse, uh, don't lose any sleep over it. It's not necessarily causing any problems. What you also see in this benchmark is what happened in this area of wine or Mesa changes. And that's, that's something I was always afraid of. It's just slowly, slowly, slowly deteriorating. It can't, be it can't really be attributed to a single change. Like this, there was one single change. Okay, so this change is probably broken. But here, can't really say what went wrong. And uh, this is really annoying because then it's really, e uh, really hard to, to get the performance back when it's deteriorated one patch after another. Because for every patch, you can argue, yeah, we need that for an additional feature. Yeah, we need that for correctness. Yeah, we need that because it makes one game faster. Difficult, difficult situation. So what can we do to improve things? Um, I will, I call this wish list, but it's more a suggestion to, to start a conversation. Uh, one, so, so all, tho all those things also have once been shortly mentioned on the, the mailing list, so they are not really new. One constant problem for us is uh, GLSL shader compile time. Uh, Windows games expect that they can see shaders during rendering and creating DirectV 9 shaders is really fast, so they just almost don't notice it. And we have some games, for example, Mass Effect 2, that time, the time to first frame. And then GLSL starts compiling all the shaders. The first frame takes 10 seconds, and that screws up the internal timing in the game. Because like you have one-tenth of a frame per second for the first frame, and then it runs at 120 frames per second. And then all the timing is screwed up. Um, Vine has some problems in that area, especially we wait for GLSL before we, we create the GLSL shader when the game actually uses them for drawing. 
the pro one problem is that in some case that CLSL shaders the code depends on some external state. Uh, the the vertex shader and the fragment shader have to be linked together, so we have to wait for the final draw to to actually link them. And this makes it just a, just creating them when they're used is pretty comfortable, but it's obviously causing troubles. Um, we can improve that for the average case. For example, we can use a GL ARB separate shader object to avoid the linking problem. I don't know if this, it, it may just move the problem into the compiler, uh, in the into the driver. I d uh, we have not tested that, but hopefully it does not. And the for 99% for of the shaders, we can make reasonable assumption at shader creation time what runtime dependent values they will use. We can compile one of them and we can and we can create one GLSL shader and then we figure out, oh, the game hits this corner case, then we just create another and then we isolate the stuttering to, to just those games that are broken. Uh, but the problem is, and this was annoying us quite a bit as an aspect, too that uh, very often the games do not give us the shader before they actually use them. So even even if we create the OpenGL shader at the time we receive the DirectDB shader, it doesn't help because it's just at the same performance critical spot. Um, so what NVIDIA has done, and I think what the Intel developer Kenusa worked on is storing the shaders on the disk and when the same application is started again, uh, load all the shaders that are stored in this shader cache, and when the game then creates a GLSL shader, just match it with a hash to the already created shader. Um, this fixed Mass Effect 2 on the NVIDIA driver, but personally, I think this is a fairly, fairly ugly solution, because when you have all this garbage on your disk, when the shader code changes, uh, it causes problems, and uh, may maybe maybe there are some nicer ways so one thing one possible idea that was mentioned is cre just creating an up unoptimized shader for the first draw compiling an optimized shader in the in a separate thread and once the separate thread is done it's compiling the optimized shader just to base it um, does any one of you have any alternative ideas to to storing those things on the disk Yeah, it's nobody, it's pretty difficult. Um, we can use the old assembler style ARB program shaders. They do not suffer that much from the compile time problem, but it's a solution we don't really like. And it only gives us newer features on NVIDIA cards. So we prefer to use GLSL. But yeah, this is, like the, the user inter the user visible symptom of that is that the game freezes for half a second when your enemy pops around the corner, kill then it kills in this half second and it's like, oh you're now you're dead because you had the compiler shader. <laughs> Call it the compiler of death. Uh, ah yes. So the question was if we uh, got game companies interested in that. Uh, do you mean in the sense that... You mean that the game company, for example, feeds us the shader, draws one time in the way it draws later? Uh, yes, yes. We have many... Plenty of game companies test the games in Wine. Uh, most of the time, like uh, we know that Blizzard tests the anti-cheat system in Wine, they stated so publicly. Because like once, a, once or twice a year, is someone who gets banned for cheating in World of Warcraft then complains, oh, I have been using Wine, I have been banned for, for because of that reason, you are evil to free software. And then Blizzard says, no, you, well, you were using Wine. We detected that, but we did not ban you for that. We, did, we banned you because you used a keyboard port out outside of Wine. So they test, so they test the anti-cheat system in Wine. I believe that Valve tests the game's anti-cheat software in Wine. 
and sometimes game developers contact us and say, hey, we know this does not work, we want you to know why, can you fix this? Uh, not, not all the game companies do that, but uh, quite a few do. And sometimes when we contact them and say, hey, you are doing something wrong here, they will fix that. Unfortunately, they never fix my favorite problem, which is infinite and not a number in, uh, in shaders. So yeah, that's uh, the next point. I like the D direct to D shaders have a compare instruction that essentially compare one, they have three input values, they compare the first one to zero and then it's essentially a conditional assignment. <laughs> And what we, what we do in GLSL is we generate, for each component that happens, we generate this uh, trinary uh, if statement. And uh, I am told by Axel Davy that this generates pretty ugly code in Mesa, especially when such a statement happens to be inside a loop. And uh, NVIDIA optimized the heck out of those statements and by that broke inf and infinite and not, uh, they broke not a number semantics. So when your source zero is not a number, then you get source one as the result in NVIDIA card because they invert the condition because it happens to generate to remove one or two instructions. And the card gets the not a number right in hardware, but since the condition is inverted, you get the wrong result in this case. And secondly, GLSL does not uh, specify how not a number should be working. So from a legal point of view, they are free to do that but it causes problems for us in our test cases and in some games. So maybe we can, we should think about uh, adding a specific GLSL instruction that matches the semantics of direct to deep compare. Maybe that, that would then re remove the, the necessity for GLSL compilers to to optimize those conditional assignments and would make it easier to, to support floating point specials. Um, do, you, do you have any thoughts on that? Like problem is making a new GL extension is always a lot of paperwork. And then you have to convince the hardware vendors to implement it and so on, but this is this is, I think, something to think about. Um, the other thing, uh, might be threading in the OpenGL driver. NVIDIA has it optional. It's, in <coughs> it's implemented in the NVIDIA driver. It's turned off by default. It's implemented in for all drivers in OS X. Um, for mine, it's, it, it's not needed, or at least for the direct for direct to d support, it's not needed because we are working on our own way of doing that and we want to do it ourselves because for some uh, direct to d is pretty strict on uh, draw on, on call ordering uh, much more strict than OpenGL is so we need our own synchronization for correctness anyway and either we have our own ring buffer we write to or we uh, or we have to use GL flush, GL finish, or maybe sync objects. So we prefer to do the multi-threading ourselves. Uh, but native OpenGL games would profit a lot because like on, on NVIDIA, the native Linux board, the main metric is NVIDIA's threading, which the game turns on by setting an environment variable before loading the game or something like that. I don't know what the interface looks like there. And I think multi-threading is something that has been talked about on the Mesa mailing, uh, mailing list. Completely different from OpenGL is uh, what you do with resolution changes when the game crashes. Uh, Windows has an external post, uh, Windows has a, a flag for change display settings that uh, allows the games to tell Windows to restore the resolution when they exit. So some games just set this and when they are done playing, they just quit by calling the, calling the see exit function or the call exit process. And then the external process restores the screen resolution. Technically, we can handle it in Rhino ourselves because we have also have some, some projects that manage the screen. But this is a game that, uh, this is a problem that also affects na Linux native games. So if you start a uh, touch tracer, change the, changes the resolution and then kill it, it will leave your 
your screen with a change resolution. So that may be something to think about for, for an X render, for, an, for the next uh, X road building resize uh, extension. And uh, finally, when you work on, on some driver or something and you see that Ryan does some stupid calls, uh, please tell us. We do, not, we do not have your perspective. We sometimes do not notice this. We, we try to avoid redundant state changes and things like that, but sometimes we do not notice them. So driver developers may have a different perspective on, on some things. So when, when you notice that we are doing stupid things, uh, please file a bug report, send me a private email, uh, send it to the mailing list. Uh, so we, we, we can then try to fix it. And uh, yeah, the, the first thing we are going to change in this regard uh, is our use of legacy content. So that's, that's a known problem and I know it causes performance difficulties. But uh, rather than just complain about the state of performance, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that what a lot of things are working well. So what Misa and Ryan, even, even without the nine state track and without much uh, multi-threading support is that the older games that have a high replayability, they work just fine. So someone who has Linux on his home machine and is an occasional gamer, he can play his Dark Ops 2 game in the evening. He doesn't have to boot Windows for that. And uh, this is running, running the replayable games that do not have the highest tankiest graphics is I think a lot more important than, uh, than running the, the newest fancy game at record frame rates. And people who want record frame rates in let's say Assassin's Creed Unity, they will probably stick to either the Windows or the Nvidia binary driver for now. But if I ha happen to have a, a Radeon GPU in my laptop and I just want to play StarCraft or I want to play Warcraft or whatever or some Age of Empires, I can do that with the code that exists today, with the code that ships on disk space today. And that is an achievement that should not be underestimated. And in that also a, another big achievement is that the monitors come on. The mode setting in my experience works pretty well and that's, people take it for granted, but that was a lot of work I can imagine. So to, to summarize my main point is that both Ryan and Misa lack manpower, especially the non-Intel parts of Misa. So I believe we should focus on one code class and making this one common code class right, uh, rather than have a half-baked G39 implementation here, a half-baked G39 implementation there, a half-baked OpenCL implementation here. Um, if, we, if we make the common code class work well, then native Linux games will work well and G39 games will work well and Spiral Draw games will work well. Um, so that's, that's at least our opinion at the Ryan Project and that's the main reason uh, why we probably most likely will not, why, why we currently do not accept the, the, Ryan, the Ryan part of the of the G39 state track uh, upstream because I think it's neither it's neither sufficient nor necessary to solve the actual problem. Um, some tasks for volunteers. You have seen my performance graphs. Uh, I could use some help to, to bisect regression, especially the, the draw overhead testers and I have some more tiny benchmarks for that. They, they sometimes show up uh, pop-up regressions and I usually wait a few weeks before I bisect them because sometimes they are fixed on their own. I could use some help with that. But um, keep in mind, this is the, the setup necessary for that is involves some work. So sometimes I have people contact me, yeah, I want to do that. And then they figure out that they have probably spent a day or two just to set up the test. Uh, they, they give up on that again. So if you are interested, if you have some computers to test this on, and are interested in helping out, uh, no C knowledge is needed, but you have to be able to use Git to compile a project. Uh, please, please send me an email. And also when you play games on Linux, uh, use, use, the uh, use the code from the Git repository. Try to catch regressions early, try to report them early. Uh, it's much easier to fix a bug uh, three days after it went into 
the tree rather than fix it after the next release. So that's mostly it from my part. Um, if there are any questions, I think now is a good time. Yes? So the question was if the, the measurements and any variables to X11 or Wayland, uh, the answer for that is I did not test Wayland. So I don't know. Yeah, I, m I may get better results here, but I think uh, I don't really expect to, because just for understand what Wayland does better are the final presents. But the final presents, are except for GLX years, are usually not the blocking, the, the limiting factor. So I did not test, so I may be wrong, but I don't think Wayland will uh, improve those things me uh, measurably. Anything else? Uh, yes? The question was if I tried to install Microsoft Visual Studio on Vine, and uh, no, unfortunately, I have not. To my, to my knowledge, uh, it the newer versions, like anything past Visual Studio 6, does not work properly because of .NET, but I may be wrong on that. So uh, you could answer that. So just to sum up the answer for the video, uh, the answer was that you can make mi up to Microsoft Visual Studio 2010 working, but uh, it needs some tricks, and those tricks, it's recorded in the application database. But there are, there are issues and bugs that you need workarounds. No more questions? Okay, so thank you for listening, and... Thank you for giving me the opportunity.